okay? Um, but I'm not giving you these case summaries in advance. What I'm going to do is put them online, uh, usually the night before class begins, you should pre late. Um, my hope is that you can all use these case summaries to fill in gaps with your notes. In other words, I don't want you to use, use these as a substitute um, for freeing the cases. Um, rather, what I want you all to do is um, go back after class and review, okay? Uh, people are still coming to class late. Um, Catherine, you're, you're late. Uh, I'll let it slide today, but you have to be on time, right? We're, we're on Zoom. We're not on real life, so we, we don't have to deal with traffic. Okay, so where do you find... Uh, you don't need to put your name in the chat. I don't know why you're doing this. I didn't ask you to. Just rename yourself in the participant list. Uh, all right, so let me show you where it is that you can find in the syllabus. Okay, uh, share screen. Okay, so if you go to the syllabus, here's the top. You scroll down, and there's a section called interaction. Okay, then there's a fold here that says class notes. See where it says that? Click class notes. You'll see a few folders. C1, C2, and case summaries. Um, uh, I have different notes for both sections. You're each independent, so don't worry about C2. Um, so if you click case summaries, you'll see summaries of the first cases we've done from the class number one, Johnson versus McIntosh. And for class number two, uh, again, be rich, Keeble, and Popov. Um, these are helpful documents. I'll just open one up so you see what it looks like. Um, here's the summary of Genvy Rich. It's about a page, no, this is about four pages long, right? Uh, I give a basic summary of the facts, but I also give what are called study guide questions. Um, you'll notice that I ask a lot of these questions in class. Um, these are designed to get you thinking about the case and to sort of flag issues that may not be um, obvious to you, all right? So definitely after class, review these. Um, just so you know, I'm actually working on a book um, with a uh, hundred of these case summaries, basically every case in the book. I'll be publishing it probably in two years or so. You get it for free now. Uh, if you take me for con law next semester, I, I publish a book called 100 Supreme Court Cases. This is going to be 100 property cases. So it, it's for your benefit. So please go through these uh, uh, lesson plan, uh, sorry, these, uh, these case summaries after the class. Don't do it now. We got plenty of stuff to do. Now go back to the class notes folder. If you click C1, you'll see that I have these documents, class one, class two. These are the notes I type in during class. Um, these are Google Docs. If you don't use Google Docs, you should. It's the, it's the absolute best. Uh, let me just show you the notes from class number one. Um, I put a few things there. Um, one, I put the link to Otter, right? Um, Otter is this very cool transcription software that I use. It's running right now. It transcribes our classes in real time. Um, after class, I'm going to paste the link to the Otter right in the class notes. You can go back and see the entire transcript of our last class, everything word for word. And if you can jump to a specific point, you know, they'll start playing it. Honestly, I'm in the same boat as Derek. Right, so you can instantly see what we did last class. It's, it's very, very cool. All right, uh, I also have some pictures and fun things. Um, you should open up today's class notes. So this is class two. Um, at the very top of the page, I include um, uh, what's called a word cloud. I'm sure you've seen this online. Uh, at the end of class, I ask you to do these minute polls, these short summaries of what, what's on your mind this is a summary of what was on your mind. It's the most common words that appear. So property, discovery, conquest theory. This is a graphic that's designed to make you quickly remember what we did last class, all right? If you scroll down, you'll see what I call poll questions. I have one, two, three, four, five. I have six poll questions for today. Um, I found to make the Zoom classes more effective to do a lot of polling a lot of polling, maybe five or six questions for class. 
you know, basically one every five or 10 minutes or so. Um, these are helpful. So I'll go through all these questions today. All right. Um, that's all I want to say at the outset. Um, questions before we get started. Yeah, Matt, Matthew, go ahead. I see your hands up. Later in the semester, will those uh, poll questions help us for studying it, for like type of the final and stuff? Yes. Yes, that's why I give them to you. Of course, uh, it's, it's such a good 1L question, but the answer is yes. Um, uh, let me put it this way. I am not very creative. Um, the sorts of things I ask in the exam are not made up you know, on the fly. Um, the sort of things I ask in the exam are based on what we did in class. Um, you know, I write a new exam every year. I don't reuse questions. And if I sense in a given year that something's bothering you, I'll ask in the exam. So I, I pay very close attention to these polling questions because they... They give me instant feedback of what's working for you, what's not. If I ask a poll question and you'll get it right, good, I move on, right? If I ask you a poll question and it's not so good, then maybe I need to spend more time on that topic. It's like my reality check that things are working, okay? All right. Yeah, I, want, I, I, I generally do that in the first day of class, but last week was a little bit too hectic and I didn't have time for it. Okay, what else, any other questions? All right, um, I probably won't do screen share again for a while. Um, so when I say question number one, um, you'll see it on your device, right? When you open up your eye clicker or you can look in the Google doc, either one, all right? All right, so now let's do question number one, the poll question, and it's a short answer. Um, when I say short answer, this is not a uh, multiple choice. It means you have to type something. It could be one word, two words, five words, a sentence, but you have to type something. All right, so question number one is this, and you'll see it on your device, or at least you should. If you don't see it, tell me. It says, when one European nation finds a new territory before other European nations, there is acquisition by blank and you need to excuse me fill in the blank okay and i usually give about a minute for these questions for the fill-ins okay i have about 37 students and 35 responses. By the way, these are not graded, but if I see that you're not doing them, that is you're leaving them blank, or that you're consistently getting them wrong, I may ask to speak to you. Um, this is for your benefit, not mine. I mean, I, I don't want to penalize students, but I want to make sure you're actually participating. Very often people start slacking off. They say, oh yeah, they put B, C, they, you know, they put a random choice. So just take it seriously. All right. Um, so let's continue the recitation. Um, I do it alphabetically. Uh, I do need your help though with one thing. I am not going to remember where I left off. I have too many sections and it's just, it's too hard to keep track. So I'll ask you to remember, I'll say, you know, who's next, right? So, you know, you're alphabetically where you stand. Uh, who was the last one I called on last class? I was. Okay. That's Natasha. Thank you. And again, please call me Josh. I don't, I don't need last names. So if Natasha was last, Paul, I think you're next, if my if my alphabet's right. I think so. Okay. All right. Thanks, Paul. All right. So what what's your answer here? Discovery. Okay, good. Right. That's the right answer. I think almost all of you got discovery. Some of you spelled it wrong, but that, that's close enough. Um, the answer here is discovery. But, Paul, I want to drill down for a bit. Why does it matter that one European nation found it before other European nations. Why is that fact important? Uh, because, I mean, discovery is kind of on a first come, first serve sort of a basis. So the first one to find it has uh, claim to the land. But is it really first come? Uh, because there were native people, they were there for, you know, some time. Well, in the way that they kind of think about it, it's like the first come that's civilized. Ah, so it's the first come among, among who? among the civilized nations. Right, the civilized European nations, right? Um, I keep saying European because that's the word that's used, but I think, I think Paul's 
just as well saying civilized. Uh, that's, 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 that's another word they use. Uh, thanks, Paul, for that's correct. All right. So think of the discovery doctrine this way, right? Among the European nations, they all often had competing claims to land, right? France says, no, it's mine. And Spain says, no, no, this is mine. The way they eliminated those conflicts was through the discovery doctrine. I said again, the way that the European nations sort of minimized conflicts was through discovery doctrine, right? What they did was they said, if you were the first European or civilized nation, to use, uh, to use um, Paul's words, the land will be yours. But of course, this isn't literally discovery because there were people there. There were people there for many, many years. All right? All right. Now let's do question number two. Again, this is just review. Nothing, nothing's new here. This is a multiple choice. You see, these, these I go, I go pretty, pretty, pretty quick with these. Question number two is this. I'll read it to you. Um, after a European nation finds a new territory, it can acquire that land through. You have choices: a conquest of the natives, b purchasing it from the natives, c both of the above, or D, not the above. Okay, go ahead. Okay, another 15 seconds or so. I think I've just met all of you. Okay, and, and uh, Azrael, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Azrael, uh, help me out here. Uh, what is your answer? So I knew A was definitely in. Okay. Um, I didn't know B was. So I chose. I, I went ahead and chose C, um, mainly because I, I didn't remember if it was European nations or if it was uh, the U.S. government that was able to, to, to buy from the natives. I know that the U.S. government was. So I wasn't sure. Ah, that's actually actually a very, very very good thought. Well, let me just give you the, um, uh, Azrael, if I can ask you a follow up question, please. Um, in Johnson, uh, you know, we have Chief Justice Marshall wrote the opinion. Did 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 the United States adopt all the rules that the Europeans had, or did they change those rules? Um, what did Marshall say? Off, they, to start off, they did. Um, but yes, actually, yes, they, they did go ahead and adopt the European rule. So if the Americans could buy land from the Indians, could the Europeans do it as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're on the right track. Let me ask one more question, Azrael. Were the Europeans and Americans required to pay for the land from the natives? Uh, I would say no, because who was going to enforce it? I don't think ah, so. Ah, okay. So then why would they pay for something they can get for free? To avoid conflict. Bingo. That's it. Very good. Thank you, Azrael. Uh, so what's the answer here? C. Yeah, okay. C is the right answer. And let me just explain why to everyone. Very good, Azrael. Um, we know conquest is in, right? That that That's there. We, we discussed this doctrine of acquisition by conquest, right? That the Europeans, if they wanted to, could just have a battle and slaughter and engage in, in just awful bloodshed. And at the end of that, they would be, you know, overpower the native people, more technology, more weapons, whatever, and they would get the land. There was an easier way to do it, right? Instead of engaging in bloody combat, they could just buy it, right? They weren't required to. They, they were well within the rights of just taking it by force. But I think most people would say, not most people, perhaps some people would say it's better to have something voluntary. Now, what do they pay for it in? That's often controversial. You know, the natives didn't value the same thing the Europeans did. They didn't value necessarily um, gold in the same way. They didn't value, um, you know, money. The paper currency was, you know, not, not very important to them. Um, it's also not clear if the natives fully understood what they were getting themselves into. They didn't always understand these treaties. They may not have understood the, the notion of 
giving property outright versus maybe just giving a, a temporary license. So the actual treaties themselves were, were very much in dispute, but keep in mind that you were able to buy the land. And in fact, that's how Johnson arose. McIntosh bought the land from the federal government and the federal government had acquired it from the natives, not through conquest, but through some sort of transaction or treaty. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, sir. I had a two. Oh, you got it, you guys, you got, if you want to speak, you have to raise your hand. I, I, you get, don't just jump right in. Yes, thank you, Zach. Uh, sorry. When, when, when I call on you, then you can speak. Otherwise, we'll have people talking over each other, and then it doesn't work. Yeah, understandable. Uh, I had a technical question on Macintosh. Yeah. Uh, because the opinion says he got a grant from the government, but if people were given the land, they got a patent. Is that correct? Okay, I don't want to get into the specifics, but you're on the right track. The the, the specific way in which the government acquired that land is actually very complicated, and I'll give you the short thumbnail sketch. Even before the United States government was formed in, in uh, 1787 with the Constitution, we had this other government, the Articles of Confederation. Right. And at some point, Virginia, which is one of the original 13 colonies, gave the land to this Articles Confederation government. How Virginia got it is even more complicated, and I really don't want to get into it. So okay. don't, don't, don't kill yourself. But the, the simple rule is that the government, whether the state or the federal government at various points, could acquire the land from the tribes. Okay. That right. helpful, Zach? Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, it's a, it's I a, figured it was more complicated. Okay. It's a right. really good question, but the short answer is um, it's messy. I actually emailed one of the editors of your case book, uh, Mr. Hilovitz, who's a good guy, and like, do you explain this? Like, yeah, he actually explains to the students how Virginia got it. I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that. It's just it's too messy. Okay, doke. Let's do question number three. And again, this is a short answer. I want you to type stuff in. Um, question number three, short answer, says this. Under the rule in Johnson versus McIntosh, the native people have the right to blank the land, but cannot blank the land. That sounds awful. That's like, you know, this is from law school Mad Libs. But <laughs> do you even know Mad Libs? Is that even a thing anymore? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's a little thing? Okay, good. All right, and I'll give you another uh, 30 seconds or so. Okay. All righty. Uh, okay, I think I think I just put everybody. We got thirty-five out of thirty-seven. Okay, a couple people haven't put in yet. All right, next up, I just did. Um, Azrael, Aaron, are you here, Aaron? Yes. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, by the way, I think I mentioned this, but but if if I call on you, I'm not talking to you, Aaron. But in, let me just take you off. My, not not. Uh, oops. Um, if I call on you and you're not here, that means you're absent. Um, very often it happened, especially last semester, that people magically walk away from their computer and they're about to be called on. Like, there'd be five people in a row who are all alphabetically next, and they all just walk away from the computer. So I started saying, okay, you're not there, you're absent. Um, and I would call on you first next class. So just just don't make me do that. All right, and Aaron, you did it. You're right, you're, right on, you're right on schedule. So Aaron, what's your answer to number three, please? I said... They have the right to possess the land, but not own the land. Okay. You have the right to possess the land, but not own the land. Let's start with the second. What does it mean to own the land? It's uh, able to sell it. Ah. Is there a difference between owning the land and selling the land? Uh, owning it is having the right to determine what's done with it. Well, I, Aaron, let me, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between owning it and possessing it? Those seem like maybe the same thing. I wasn't sure if possess was the right word. But What's the word that Marshall it. used? He used it over and over again in, in, in Johnson. The, the, the Indians have the right to blank the land. Occupy it? Oh, occupy. Now we're getting on the right track. What does occupy mean? That's just a dwelling on the land. Well, like a dwelling, right? They can, they can reside. They can live there. 
But what can the Indians not do, Aaron? I think I think you're almost there. They're not able to. Uh... What affect what's done with it, or? Well, how did this case arise? Who, what, what, who was Johnson? Why was Johnson this case? Because he had per, he had a ah he inherited what it from a native tribe. Okay, do you say inherited? Or it was a uh, it was inherit it was from it was given by G given for free. No, it, it was sold. Sold. Okay, can the Indians sell property? Okay. So, but, but can they, they can occupy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. There we go. We got it finally. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. All right. So the rule in Johnson is that the Indians can occupy or um, basically live on the land. That's just fine. But the Indians cannot sell it. Right. And I want you to start thinking about property in this sort of way. Um, when, when I say, do you own something? That's often a very you know, messy question. What does it mean to own something? Right. You know, for example, if you're living in an apartment, do you own your apartment? No, you can live in it for some period of time, maybe a year. You can sell, uh, can you sell it. No, you can't sell it. Um, can you have guests over? Maybe for a few days, but not like permanently. Then you need to have a sublease or something. You have a roommate. You'd like to have a roommate, right? Property is about your relationship to a piece of land. It's not a set thing of do you own it or not, right? You know, I, I bought my house, but I'm not the only person who lives there. And I live in a homeowners association, HOA. There's certain things I can't do in my property, right? And I have to let people walk in the front yard. So property is not the sort of absolute. There are always going to be different facets of how you use it. And start thinking of property in that sort of, uh, sort of complex way. All right. I think that's what I want to do for review. Does that make sense? Any more questions on Johnson from the first class? I always try to, always try and start class off by making sense of the last class. That, that helps. I do not see any hands. All right. All right, let's move on to today's material then. And let's do question number four. Lots of questions, I tell you. It's, they're, they're for your benefit. And to, after class, go back and check your answers as well, just to sort of see your progress for the semester. All right, question number four. Again, it's a short answer. What is a usage what is a usage okay another 20 seconds or so and i'll be calling on uh angelina i'm sorry emily emily next i apologize emily Are you ready for me to answer? No, I'll call on you when I'm ready. Uh, uh, just, I'll, just another, another five seconds while I get one type in their answer. Okay. All right, Emily, you here now? Yes, I am. Okay, thanks, Emily. Emily, what is a usage? Um, I put that it was a. I put that it was like a custom. Okay. What's a custom? A custom is the way that things are usually done, a tradition, the normal manner of carrying of carrying things out. Okay. So a custom, a usage is a custom, and that's the normal way of carrying things out. Uh, let me ask you a follow-up, please, Emily. Um, how are we supposed to know what is and is not a custom? Um from history, from common practice, from the community's practice, 
in the area. In the ah, okay, now we're getting closer. So you said the community's practice in a given area. Which community? Or how do we know what community we're talking about? Well, um, I mean, it can be it can be regional if you're talking about an industry. Um, ah, okay, no, no, now we're getting from closer. So you're saying an industry can have a custom. What, what do you mean by that, an industry? Now, now we're getting much closer to where I want to go. I'm sorry, what's that? You said an industry can have a, have a culture or a custom. What do you mean by an industry? I think now we're getting where I want to where I want to go with this question. A profession, a way of earning a living. Um, ah. An area of commerce. Okay. All right. Thank you, Emily. Okay, uh, Angelina, are you here? Yes. Okay. So let me. I want to follow up what Emily said a minute ago. Okay. She said that an industry or a profession can have customs. How do industries, professions develop these usages or customs? How does this, how does this happen? They can do so through policy. Um, it could be like a, a workplace custom. So if everyone knows that, for example, that say that there's five employees, they may have this thing where, you know, they use the coffee pot, something as simple as that. And whenever it's out, you know, whoever was the person to, the last cup goes ahead and fills it in. It could be something. That's I like that. It's a good example. So everyone knows when the pot's empty, you have to do it. Or if the garbage can's full, you have to take it out, right? You, you know these right. sorts of things. Now, um, Angelina, are do you have to write down these sort of customs or usages? Does that have to be in writing somewhere? No, those kind of things are kind of formed out of habit and formed just out of habit. Kind of almost traditional all right in a sense i like that so traditional so you said if there's a you know office with five people they all have the same custom right. now what happens if we're not talking about within a single business but we're talking across an entire industry in other words how does company a get on the same page as company b has that so happened so two different engines are saying kind of like walmart and target versus like this walmart versus the other walmart industry. right yeah, how do you enforce customs across different people in the industry? Well, generally, um, whenever you see that something is working very well for one company, um, the other company m may be kind of upheld to those standards, whether or not hmm. that was something that they initially were trying to do. And then it becomes easy to adapt. But what if, what if one company tries to get an advantage over the other? Um, then that would take advantage so, and they ignore all these customs to take advantage to get a, to get a, a leg up. Well, depending on what those things are, uh, they could be taken to court. Ah, or, okay. Okay. Now we're getting closer. Alec, are you here, Alec? Yes, I'm here. All right, I want to follow up on what Angelina said. She said that if a company doesn't follow one of these customs or usages, it may actually be, Illegal that that company A can sue company B for violating a, a norm or, or a usage. How does that work? How, how do you go to court? I mean, you're, you're now, I guess, second semester law students. How do you go to court and say, Your Honor, he's violating a norm? Is, is that a statute? Is that a common law? Is that a UCC? You know what? What the hell is that? How do how do you go to court for violating some sort of unwritten rule? Uh, it's not like it would be a written down statute that's been violated, but it would just have to be shown that it's been widely accepted by a large portion of that industry. That How are it. courts, Alec, come on, help me out here. You're a judge, right? Maybe you're going to be a law clerk one day soon. How the heck is a judge supposed to say, I am enforcing a damage award because you violate some unwritten custom that no one, no government officials ever recognized? How the heck is that supposed to work? It just does. Trying oh, to promote, they're trying to promote equity. Ec oh, equity. Oh, my faith. I I hate the word. I hate the word fairness. It's my F word. I just I hate that word. It doesn't mean anything, right? It, it, it has no meaning. I will never say something. Is that fair? I will never ask that question because it's a meaningless question. We all have different senses of fairness, and I doesn't get it. But Alec, how do we know what these rules are if they're not written down? I mean, that's my question. We don't write. They're not written down. It's not a there's no precedent. There's no case. There's no statute. There's no restatement. How do we know what these customs are? 
Uh, I just really the only way to be able to know what, what they are is based on what the industry does. I mean, you have to you have to see how things are but, throughout. Yeah, but but okay, good. So uh, Tyler, are you here, Tyler? Yes. So Tyler, um, Alex says we we can know what the customs are by looking at the industry does, but isn't the very nature of this dispute there's there's not agreement on the custom? Company A says one thing, and then Company B says something else, right? They don't even agree what the custom is. Right. How is then a court supposed to resolve what the right custom is if if two people in this field can't even agree on it? I'm not sure how the court is supposed to resolve it other than, you know, looking at what has been done traditionally and what they're, what the company is proposing to be changed. To. Ah, oh, so you're saying if company A is trying to maybe deviate from what's been done before, that's a signal that company A is, is wrong. Is that what, that what you're getting at? No, not necessarily. It's the circumstances have to be looked at as well. Like how plentiful is the resource? Uh, what will the change entail? Like how much damage to the resource will there be? And will there be any extra benefits from changing? Wait a minute, wait, hold, hold on. I thought we're deciding these cases based on custom. Now we're deciding it based on, you know, the, the amount of resources. Is that, is that, is that different than custom? Is that something, something separate? Well, you kind of have to look at both. You have to? I would, I would think so. Because if you're looking at, if you're looking at custom, what they've done traditionally, they've done because it's worked as far as the resource goes and the profit to the company goes. Uh -huh. And if company A is trying to change what has done in the past, you know, I mean, they might be able to do it. But if enough companies start to change to that new custom, then is the whole system going to collapse? All right. Let me, I think Willie, here, Willie, you're next. Yes. I'm here. Willie, let me ask you another question if I can, please. Why did if there's an industry and they have these customs, why do they need to go to the courts? Why can't they resolve this in their own? In other words, if 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 you, if you have these hunters, for example, you know, why can't hunters just to solve, resolve these messes in themselves? Why do they need to go to a court who is not a hunter, doesn't know the industry? Um, by going to the court, I think it's easier to establish a standard practice for all parties uh, and across an industry as opposed to, uh, it's easier to resolve and sets a precedent as opposed to just two parties disputing like one thing. It's harder to come to one resolution that everybody's gonna abide by. So, so, so we're comfortable with judges who are not hunters saying the standard for hunters. Well, I like to think that they make these decisions considering standards of industry that are well informed. So yes. Okay. All right. So I think we've beaten this issue almost to death. But I think I think let me just try to summarize from getting at here. Um, the cases we have today, um, uh, uh, again, um, Keeble and uh, Popov, right? Um, are all cases discussing possession and how do you acquire something? Um, and in all three cases, the courts look to custom and usages. These are not written down. These are not statutes. These are not codes, not restatements. These are traditions. And more importantly, they're traditions people don't agree on. Right? Popov and Hayashi did not agree on the right standard to catch a baseball. Right? Gen and Rich did not agree on the right standard to catch a, to catch a whale. Um, Keeble, you know, the neighbors hated each other. They were firing guns at each other, right? At their duck ponds, right? And they had to go to the courts. So I think the, the short answer is the judges have to do something, right? Parties go to a court with a dispute and the judges can't say, yeah, you know what? I don't care. Deal with it yourselves, right? Uh, it's not, not my problem. I, I, I don't care. Uh, I, I guess judges could do that. That would not be a very satisfying opinion. It would be good for law school, but judges have to do something. And I think what the judge has tried to do in all three of these cases was to determine as closely and carefully as they could what the relevant custom is or what the relevant usage is. And they tried to see which party was closer to that usage and which party was trying to depart, deviate from that usage. 
Um, but I think all three judges recognized there was not a clear answer here, and, and they sort of did the best they could. All right, any questions so far? Okie doke. Let's go next to um, uh, Zach. Zach, are you here? Yep. Yeah, no, I think I saw you earlier. Okay. Uh, you want to give me the facts, please, in our first case? Uh, again, uh, be rich, please. Sure. Um, they're both uh, whalemen who are engaged in whaling for oil business. Just but by the by the way, uh, it, you may not know this, but you know today we generally get whale. Uh, well, we get oil from the ground. We dig. We drill. Whatever. Back in the 1800s, the way you would get oil was actually by killing whales. It was not a very efficient method. You would, you know, you would take this 70 ton ginormous whale and maybe make about you know two dozen barrels of oil. Right? This is not very effective. Um, but but they would basically chop up the blubber of the skin, and they were able to what's called try or extract oil from the skin. They would use it for like lamp oil, heating oil, things like that. Just just background which may may not know. All right, Zach, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Anyway. Good. Um, okay, go on. Gen, Gen uh, kills the whale uh, by harpooning it, uh, but based on the physical world that we live in, the whale sinks. Oh, let me let me just stop you right there. So he shot one of these bomb lances at the whale, right? Correct. Right. This is like these. Imagine a spear with a rocket on it, right? Where you basically shoot out um, a spear. Yeah. It's... Do we know? Zach, that Gen actually killed the whale. Do we, do we know for sure? Yes, because the bomb lances are labeled um, and they have identifying marks on them based on oh. the hunter so that we know who kills it. Because when you kill the whale in the ocean, it's going to sink. So it's right. going to be hard to catch it on the spot and possess it on the spot. Okay, very so, good. Very good. Okay, so Zach said a few things. I want to just unpack them, right? First... The whaling industry is unique, right? It's impossible to tow a live whale back to shore. You can't. It's, it's too big. Even so, today's standards, yeah. Yeah, it's just these, these things are like 70 tons. Just, you can't do it. So what they would do is they would kill the whales. Mm -hmm. And the whale would, upon its death, sink to the bottom of the ocean. And this is kind of gross, but basically eventually it's just, it, it blows up, right? All the air comes out of it, and it sort of lightens up. It floats to the surface, and then hopefully they find it. Now, how were the whalers smart about this? They would use a little tip on their bomb lance with a specific markings. Imagine like a star, right? This crew is the star crew. And if they find a, uh, an incision, right? Basically a piercing in the skin that's a star, you know it's this crew's boat. Think of it like a cattle brand, right? We're in Texas, right? If you drive all around Texas, you'll see different ranches with little symbols on their ranch. That's their brand. They would put that brand on their cattle, so you know this is Josh's cattle. This is Zach's cattle, and then you don't you don't steal someone's cattle. It's a that's that's a that's a capital offense. I maybe it used to be. I'm not sure if it still is, right? Um, that was here. Okay, Zach. Thanks so much. So the idea was you would use these brands on these these bomb lances to determine who whose whale was whose. Uh, that was Zach. Uh, Catherine, are you here? Catherine R. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So, Catherine, after you shot one of these whales and it sort of sank down and floated up, what 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 happened next usually? So it would take a couple of days for the whale to kind of resurface, and they would go back and get it. But oftentimes, other people would find the whale, and so they would go back to, I guess, the town and they would, find, I guess, like find the person from like the bomb lances that they had, mm -hmm. and they would get like a part of the money. Ah, okay, good. So generally the, 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 the right thing to do is if you find one of these whales, let's say the whale washes ashore on the beach, right? Right, yeah, and these are, these are huge whales. You would go to the town and say, hey, I found a whale with this symbol in it. Um, whose is it, right? And then someone would show up and pick up the whale and then the finder would get a cut. We would get literally a cut, but we get a, get some money. It's called a salvage fee, right? Catherine, is that what happened here in our case? No, um, the man like took it to auction. Basically, he pretended and it was his. Yeah, yeah. 
He pretended it was his. All right, thank you, Catherine. So here we have a not so honest finder, right? Uh, Ellis was his name. Ellis says, oh, wow, a whale wash ashore on the beach. My lucky day. Uh, let me go sell it. Now, when you put a whale for an auction, and this guy Ellis was not the whaler, people probably knew something was up. They knew this wasn't, you know, this wasn't the right thing to do, but they did it anyway. And then you have Rich, right? Uh, Pierce, you here? Yes. Pierce, did Rich know that Gen was the hunter that, or the whaler that caught the whale? Uh, no. But should Rich have known that this was probably from some whaling crew in the area? Uh, yes. Did, he bought it. He, he he bought it anyway, didn't he? Mm -hmm. All right. Why do you think he bought it, knowing that there was probably some other whaling crew that that, that hunted it? Uh, excuse me. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Why would Rich buy this, knowing that someone else hunted it? What was he thinking? Uh, Guess that no one would find out. Would yeah, he was. Away. Yeah, yeah. He was hoping no one would find out. I, I, th I think that's exactly right. He was hoping no one would find out. Uh, Pierce did. Did did Gen find out? Yes. Mm -hmm. They always find out, right? Um, you know, cheaters never win, right? Um, thanks, thanks, Pierce. Cheaters never win. They always lose, especially in our cases. Uh, you always get caught because I mean, look, come on, guys. You're going to sell a, a like a 70 ton well. No one's going to know about it. People are going to find that it's a pretty big deal. And this was a dangerous profession. Um, you know, if you go to the class notes and scroll through the pictures, people would die, right? You have this ginormous whale with its flipper, you know, knocking boats out of the water. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. This is, this is not a safe profession. It's not like duck hunting where like, you know, duck flies away, whatever. The, if the whale gets away, it'll kill you. It'll destroy your boat. It'll smash you into pieces, for, throw you into the freezing sea. All right. So Gen sues Rich for the value of the whale. Obviously, the whale's been destroyed. You can't return the whale. Who, who even wants the whale? You want the money. All right. Uh, that was Pierce. Uh, uh, how do you say your name? Uh, Byung Guan? Uh, I wrote Brian, but, but oh, that's, okay. I, yeah. If you heard Brian, I can do Brian. Whatever, no, okay. whatever you prefer. I, I, yeah, I, I'm looking at the the roster because I don't always check the Zoom in the same way. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. yeah. Bri I'll go by Brian. That's fine, Brian. So, Brian, um, how did the judge go about deciding um, this case? Um, he looked at the previous cases where they rely on the customs. Mm, okay, so so tell me about those cases, please, Brian. Um, well, first one is, let's see, it talks about, what is it, like the Arctic whale hunters, how, like, limited, what is it, they're, like, limited ways of, like, marking, or it's, like, Well, let, Brian, let me ask the question like this. Is it possible to put a whale on your boat and bring it back to shore? Um, I mean, not like I guess not on the boat. Well, can you can you maybe take a live whale and connect it to your boat and drag it back to shore? Yeah, a live whale. No, 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 not a live whale. No, no. no well, yeah. why? Yeah, okay. Now on the right track. Yes. Why? Why can you not drag a live whale back to shore on your boat with say like an anchor? I don't know because it's gonna like. Move around, yeah, it's going to run away. Yeah, it's going to destroy your boat. Okay, so how did the customs develop for hunting whales? Just in, in light of that, in light of that simple fact. Oh, I mean, it has to be stationary. It has to be dead. You know, they have to be able to control it. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the minimal act that you need to claim an interest in the whale? What's like the if you actually get the whale, right? Let's say that you harpoon the whale. And you find it floating in the ocean two years later, great, it's yours, right? No one's going to doubt that's yours. But what's the minimal act that you need to do to signal this is your whale? Oh, it's like you have to show that you're trying to take, what is it, 
possession of it. Like you have to act on it. Right, no, but but you you say take possession. That's my question. What is the most minimal act you need to take possession? That, that's my question, Brian. Shoot it. Brand it. Okay, yeah. so is it enough just to shoot it? Do you have to kill it? And then kill it, yeah, okay. But how do you know that your shot killed it? Uh, I mean, because I don't know. For all you know, maybe like you shot it and died the next day of old age. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You have to see it. Whale autopsy it, is enough to just see the whale. No. Is that enough? No, I mean you have to see it dead. No. Yeah, but how do you know you were the one who killed it? Maybe it died of old age. Oh well, I mean you. I mean, if you shot it. And then it died right there. And then there's a mark. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you little... shot it, you know, on, on the maybe, on the blubber. Yeah. It sort of just bounced off. It didn't really kill it. Huh. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I have no idea. That's why I asked it. Yeah, Brian. Uh, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, Bradley, you here, Bradley? Yeah, I am. I'm here. I so, go by Brad. Uh, Brad. Brad, let me ask you the question I gave to Brian a minute ago. How do you... What's the minimal act you need to show that you've actually captured the whale, right? You don't have to actually capture with your bare hands. You, you can't. The whale's too damn big. But what's like the minimal act you need? Um, I think the book kind of talked about how you would have to, whether or not it's been, well, once it's been killed and everything, it was either you tied it up to the, your ship or like you were the first one, I guess, to find it in that sense. Well, find it just with your eyes. There's enough to look at and say, ah, there's a whale. It's mine. Well, no, like you have to go and like they talked about one of the things was um, you had to, um, what was it? Whoever was the first person to tie like their, uh, uh -huh. not rope of some, whatever it's called. The line. Like, yeah. yeah the line around it. And then they were, that was the first person that said, okay, you have ownership of it. And then I guess from there, if you really discovered you weren't, that's not the one you killed or anything, you could go about, you know, giving it to the correct owner for it. But that was when they first said, this is the person that owns it. Okay, I think I think we're almost there. Thank you, Brad. Um, let me let me try to summarize a bit if I can. You have these three cases that are discussed, right? Uh, the first is called Tabor, uh, the second is called Bartlett, and the third one is called Swift. And all three judges were, I'm sorry, all three cases were um, decided along very similar lines, and they all relied on this notion of customer usage. Um, and the general rule from these three cases is you didn't have to actually capture the whale that is, you know, grab it with your own hands. Um, you didn't have to drag the boat, I'm sorry, drag the whale with your own boat. You had to mark it with some sort of physical device. The iron holds the whale, so to speak, right? If you were the first, um, you know, if you were the first boat to actually attach your iron, your, your, your harpoon to the whale, it was yours. You know, let's say that you throw a, an, a, a, a chain at the whale and it bounces off. Oh, that doesn't count. You know, let's say you shoot a bomb lance and sort of, you know, grazes the whale, like sort of like bounces off its skin. That's not going to be enough either. You need to actually puncture the skin. And that's where your little brand will become visible. This, this puncture becomes very important. Um, now, there's another argument that, that that's floated. Um, uh, Zainab, how do you say your name? Uh, Zainab. Zainab, let me ask you a question, please, Zainab. Um, why can't we just have a rule where finders keep it, right? If you find the dead whale floating the ocean, it's yours. If you find the dead whale floating the beach, it's yours. Why, isn't that a simpler rule? Why, why don't we have that rule? Um, because then it doesn't like help like prevail business or industry. Why is that important? Why are courts trying to help business? Why is that an important rule? Why why should courts consider that policy consideration? I think it's something with like In terms of like community, in order to like help a community as a whole. Right, but why? Why are judges helping communities? To like secure like revenue and profit. I think but, I'm but just going around this. Thing. You're giving me a circular answer, but why yeah. a judge is supposed to secure revenue and profit?
Oh, yeah. Why? They, <laughs> maintain. I'm just going to say the same thing. Like, maintain. There's not a good answer. I, I, I've let you flounder enough. Th th thank you for that. Um, you know, why, right? Why are we, um, why are judges doing this? They don't actually say it. Uh, but I think what's going on here is that judges want to reward people who put labor into their work. This is sort of the labor theory we talked about last week. That if you spend all this time hunting and chasing down foxes and whales and these other animals, you should be rewarded for it. And it's it seems to be, and I hate the word, unfair to reward the person who simply finds the whale floating in the sea who didn't have to go hunt this, this dangerous beast. So you're going to see a lot of discussion in these topics about rewarding labor. Now, the other rule is a lot easier, Right. Finder's keeper, whoever gets the ball keeps it. If you find the whale, it's yours. If you find the baseball, it's yours. Who cares? Who cares how much work you put into it? So you have one rule that seems more fair. That's the labor theory that if you put all this work into it, it's yours. You have this sort of fair rule. And you have another rule, finder's keeper, that's pretty certain. It's yours. You found it. You have the whale. You have the ball. Keep in mind these two considerations. One is the labor theory is very fair, and this sort of finder's keeper, this capture rule, is more certain. Neither is right or wrong, and in fact, courts sort of look at both of them throughout the course of this semester. Okay. So ultimately, the court rules in favor of Gen. They find that Gen had followed the custom. Rich did not. He ignored the custom. Therefore, again, prevails, and they awarded him about $70 in damages for the value of the oil, which is about $2,000 in present-day money. Not very much, but I think this court set an important precedent that uh, people who tried to cheat and sell the whales at auction would lose. I think that's why this case was there. Questions on Gen? Questions on Gen? Um, question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Matthew. They talk about the uh, this this word appropriation whenever they whenever we bring up this case. I'm just kind of trying to figure out what they mean by so like one line says it requires in the first take of the only act of appropriation that is possible in the nature of the case. What do they mean by appropriation? Right, appropriation is just another word for take. Right. He's taking ownership. He's taking possession. That's what appropriation means. But that doesn't tell you what it means to take possession. It's only a theory. And in this case, the theory is you appropriate property when you put the iron onto it. You, you, you basically, you, you, you've taken the first step to acquire it. That help? Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Azrael, go ahead. Um, so with the tragedy of the commons and there's no more whale hunting anymore, um, what rule are we exactly supposed to from Gen. All the above. Yeah. The, the short answer is just not a single rule. The court doesn't give you a rule. But if I had to sort of summarize it, the labor theory seems to be very important to the court that you want to reward the people who more labor into this, into the hunt and not the person who just by chance finds it floating in the beach. That makes sense? Yeah, Josh. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Let's do guys question number five and move on to the Keeble case for our next case. Um, Again, short answer, number five. Who owned the ducks on Keeble's pond? Who owns the ducks on Keeble's pond? And this will be a question for Freddie, I think, is next.
Good. Get a one. Freddie, what's your answer here? Um, my answer was Keeble, the owner of the pond. Okay. So you're saying Keeble owns the ducks. How do you know that? How do you know that Keeble owns the ducks on his pond? This might sound like an obvious question, but the answer is not so obvious. Um, I was thinking that he owned the ducks because he owned the, the land that they were on. Now, are ducks domesticated animals? Are they like a, you know, a chicken or a, or a cow that, that lives in a farm? No. No. So a duck can be on my pond today and maybe in your pond tomorrow. I don't have a pond. I don't think you have a pond either. But in theory, you know, ducks go from my pond to your pond, right? Mm -hmm. Can you own a wild animal? Not necessarily. You would have to How do you just kill it first. Oh, so the only way to own a duck is to kill it? Can you own a live duck? No. So the question they asked you is, who owned the ducks in Keeble's pond? You said Keeble. So can Keeble own the live ducks in his pond? No, he can't. No, he can't own them. But maybe he could. Um, maybe he could have a right to them. Ooh, what do you mean a right? Like he, once the ducks are on his land, he he doesn't own them, but he has the right to, I would say, like acquire them. Ah, possess them. and what if I go to, you know, I try and shoot a duck on Keeble's pond. Can I do that? No. Why not? Not without his permission. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Freddie. All right. So I want to highlight an aspect of this case that's discussed in the notes, but, but students often um, miss. Um, and I'm going to type in the notes. I'll type at the very top of the document. The doctrine called... Rationy Soli. Let's see it. Rationy Soli. It's spelled R A T I O N E Soli. S O L I. Rationy Soli. Um, Rationy Soli is this doctrine that says you own the wild animals on your property so long as they're wild animals on your property. If they fly away, they're not yours anymore. But so long as they're on your property, they're yours. Right, so if there's if you have a forest that you own, if there's deer running through it, so long as the deer are on your property, you can hunt them. They're yours. If you have a pond, you can hunt the ducks on your pond. Right? You have ownership of the animals on your land, wild animals. If they fly away, they're not yours anymore. All right. Everyone with me. Yes, Zach. At what point do they stop being his? When they're no longer on his land. When they escape. When a duck flies away to somewhere else, it's not yours anymore. Does that mean when they're five feet off the ground? When they're outside of his fence, ten feet off the ground? It's a really good question. Um, there's a common law doctrine that says you own all of your land up to the heavens and down to Hades, down to hell. So in theory, if they go straight up, it's yours. If they move one inch over the property line, they're, they're not yours anymore. So you can do a duck hunt in the air. The, the, your air rights are yours. Right. I remember that from the torch one. Yeah. But we also don't let people say the plane can't fly over my house. We'll talk out. about airplanes and property too. The airplanes actually are a very tricky application of the uh, ad coelum doctrine, which we'll get to maybe next semester. Okay. But a common law before airplanes, a duck in your airspace was yours. Okay. Fair yeah, but don't don't start shooting airplanes. <laughs> There's actually a lot of litigation now. People shooting drones over their property. That's the that's the new thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, guys putting on their jetpack and flying at the airport. Yeah, we've seen that. Bennett, go ahead. If you technically own the wild animals on your land at the time, are you able to? My thinking is you can make a business out of that if you really wanted to. Sure. You capture these animals and then sell them to whoever. Yeah. That would be that would be fine. Yeah. It's yours. So speaking of business, right? Let me call on uh, Catherine W. Are you here, Catherine? Yes. So Catherine, let me ask you the question. The facts of, of uh, Keeble are actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, Keeble had a duck pond. 
Uh, and he had these little, what called duck decoys, basically traps to try to trap ducks. This was a hobby. I don't think it was a business. And then he had a neighbor. He was a bit of a jerk, Hickeringill, who would fire his loud gun to scare away the ducks. Was Catherine, was Hickeringill allowed to fire a duck at the, I'm sorry, fire this gun at at his property, at Keeble's property? Can you do this? Um, I want to say yes, but I only want to say that because I know that they said the cause of action was because um, he's tech by doing that, he's getting in the way of Keeble's livelihood. Uh, but isn't there a simple way to sign this case? Sorry, could you say that again? I'm sorry, I was chewing. Isn't there a simpler way to sign this case? Um, Didn't we say the ducks belong to Keeble? Yes. And didn't the guns interfere then with Keeble's property? Yes, because the second time he shot the gun, the ducks completely abandoned the farm. So why do we need to get into this sort of unfair competition doctrine? Because um, Hickringill had also opened up a decoy pond next door. D did he? Yes. I they both had decoy ponds. I don't think so. I think the court said he could open it up. I don't think he actually did. I think, I think you may have just slightly misread that. Uh, Ashley, here? Yes, I am. Ashley, why did the court get into its unfair competition doctrine if there's a, such an easier way of resolving this? Well, um, the neighbor, um, it caused a disturbance to the property owner, mm -hmm. and it also derived him a profit. Okay. Was this actually his business, or was this a hobby, you think, Ashley? Um, did, did you get the impression this, this is like some sort of you know, guy who ate ducks for food, or is this just sort of fun? Well, actually, when I was reading it at the beginning, I thought it was more of an enjoyment because I think it yeah. said that it took away from his enjoyment. And then when the courts are talking about it, it said that it took away from his profit, but I would lean more towards enjoyment. Okay, very good. I think this is a hobby. So, you know, I always teach this case, it's not entirely clear to me why the court chose this path. The ducks were, I think, belonging to Mr. Keeble. And I think that Hickringill interfered with his property, and that's enough for a trespass action, right? Um, but instead, the court shows a different analysis. The court said, you cannot interfere with someone else's livelihood. Okay? So it's actually a fairly simple holding, but I think it's probably not the best holding. So any questions then on the Keeble case, that, right, that you can't interfere with someone else's livelihood. You can compete with them. You can open up your own. This is, I think, where um, Catherine may have misread it. You can open up a competing duck decoy, and maybe you attract even more ducks, but you can't start shooting your gun to scare away his ducks. Yes, uh, Alec and then Derek. For instance, in this case, he did it with the purpose to scare away the ducks. But what if you were hunting ducks on his own property and as a consequence scared away uh, Keeble's ducks? I mean, yeah. yeah, I think that that would be a different case. I think if, you know, let's say he had a hunting reserve in his property and he created lots of noise, you know, that could be a nuisance or something like that as well, uh, even, if his, if, even if his intent was different. Right, but this wasn't also a nuisance claim. He didn't bring a claim for a nuisance that you're making noise. It was you interfering with my business. So it's a very specific claim that was brought here. Yeah, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, Josh, uh, my question is with um, the... Note two, the uh, last sentence there, it says the. Hold on, hold on. Would you, would you give me a page number? I, I'm not sure where note two is. Page 37. Okay, thank you. I'll bring it up. Okay, page 37, note two, uh, last sentence. Okay, which sentence you're saying? I'm uh, sorry, the second paragraph of note two, the last sentence. It says the judge ruled uh, on the theory of malicious interference with the trade. So was it his livelihood or was it with the trade? <sighs> I don't know that the court used the language trade in the same way uh, you, you might be thinking of it. I think it's actually a little bit unclear. Um, hunting is definitely a trade, but my sense is he was doing it for sport, for hobby, for fun. 
Uh, but for the court, I don't think it mattered. I think the court said, look, it, it's legal to hunt and that's his profession. That's what he's doing. Okay. I just want to make yep. sure there weren't. Yeah. I think they use the word trade perhaps on the same way that we might use it today. Right. You, you could make a livelihood from it, but I think these are pretty wealthy people. You know, they were not doing this for money, for ducks. They were doing it for, for, for sport. All right. Thanks, Derek. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Ben, go ahead. So what we're really focusing on is the intent of uh, the, the guy who fired the gun. That's what we're mainly focused on there. I think that's what pissed off the court. <laughs> I think I, I think I think the judge was very annoyed that he was trying to deprive uh, what's his face keep all the ducks. That was his intent. Because it does say on the top of page forty two that Pickering Gill did have a decoy pond the pond hall, and so I guess we're trying to determine whether he was just trying to scare away the other ducks or if he was actually firing. Yeah, I think. Decoy. Yeah, I think. Yeah, look, I think what happened here is he wasn't trying to get ducks for himself. He was just trying to piss off his neighbor. I think since we're a feud. Okay. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. The case didn't mention the Hickman Glass. I'm sorry, um, Catherine. I, I apologize. It is in the notes afterwards that he did have the decoy uh, that he had this, uh, one close by. But I don't think that was part of the court's opinion. So I apologize, Catherine. Okay. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Uh, are we going to look? Are we looking at the fact that it was a malicious act that he did? I think the intent, the specific intent, that did matter, right? This wasn't like he accidentally fired his gun and scared some ducks. He did it several times deliberately. Okay. Okay. All right. We only have a few minutes left. Let me do the last case. Um, the last case is a fun case. It was baseball, and maybe you're a baseball fan. Maybe not. I, I don't know. Uh, but this was a huge deal back in the 2000s. Uh, Barry Bonds was a very famous baseball player. He uh, he hit balls very far. He was very good at that. Uh, and in one season, he hit 73 home runs, which was, at the time, the, the major league record. Uh, it later turned out that Bonds was using many steroids, so his, his records became kind of, um, uh, uh, shall we say, tainted. But at the time, it was a huge deal. Um, so here's the setup. Uh, Bonds hits the home run. Right, he hits this ball almost 400 feet. It flies into the spectator section, and there are a lot of people who are just waiting there for this ball. One guy, Popov, puts out his glove, and the ball hits his glove. And, and let me just show you um, a still shot. Um, uh, screen sharing. There's there's a video which I don't have time to play, unfortunately. Uh, but there's a video uh, I linked to in YouTube. But I want to just show you the shot of how how crazy this was. Uh, okay, everyone see this video or this still shot right over here. So you can see over here. There's a guy holding his arm up, right? And see this little thing? That's the ball. So the ball was hit to the outfield. Popov reaches his hand up, catches the ball. The ball hits the, the webbing of his glove. Almost as soon as he makes contact with the ball, he's mobbed. People knock him over. They knock him down. He's on the ground. People are piling on top of him. People are punching him and kicking him and trying to knock the ball loose. Why are they doing this? Because a ball be worth a million dollars. Somehow, we don't exactly know where, the ball gets knocked out of his glove. We don't know when it happened, we don't know how it happened. And the ball's rolling on the ground. And then we have Mr. Hayashi comes along. He was also in this sort of mob scene. Somehow, Hayashi sees the ball on the floor. He picks it up and puts it in his pocket. Smart guy. He then sort of walks out of this skirmish and he holds the ball up for the camera and he has the ball. At that point, 
Papa sues Hayashi for conversion, the tort of conversion. And the court has to decide who owns the ball. This is a hard case that's actually real. It's not about whales and foxes. It's a million-dollar baseball. So Popov and Hayashi argue two different things, right? Popov argues that it was his. Why? Because his glove stopped the ball's momentum. The ball was flying, and he was the one who stopped it. It doesn't matter that he didn't come down with the ball because he was mobbed. Hayashi argues and said that you have possession of the ball when you have complete dominion over the ball, when you have absolute control over it, right? There's no doubt. You're not bobbling it. It's yours. The court does something funny. They say that Hayashi's right, that in order to have the ball, you must have complete dominion. But then they do something funny. They say, well, it's a matter of equity, though. It's really not fair that Popov gets nothing. Right, the fact that he was able to stop the ball's momentum gives him some interest in the ball, and they call it. I want to make sure I get this phrase right. I always say it wrong. Um, he calls it a legally cognizable prepossessory interest. I don't know what the hell that means, but it basically means you have some interest in the ball before you actually capture it. Right. So by the time Hayashi got the ball. It wasn't his 100%. Popov had another claim to the ball. And the way the court resolves this dispute is to just say, you know what? Equitable distribution. We're going to just sell the ball at auction, divide the money in half. I mean, if this was the judge's ruling, he took a long way of getting this. This is just such an obvious ruling. Uh, but he had to really go through step by step of when you actually acquire the ball. And part of the court's analysis was custom. He said that fans expect to have the ball, you have the ball. It's yours, right? It's something that you have yourself. So in the end, the court says, sell the ball. Well, they sold the ball from, you know, at auction, but it didn't get a million dollars. It got barely $400,000. And at that point, Popov had so many fees, he was actually bankrupt. He had, he had attorney's fees. He couldn't even pay his bills. So his lawyer basically had to seize the money he got from the auction. Things never end well when you go to lawyers, right? Don't ever hire lawyers. All right. Um, I am out of time now. I'm at 10.15. Uh, uh, I'm going to start the minute poll. If you could please type in any sort of questions or thoughts you might have um, into the chat. I'll lose open now. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, ask them now. Or if you want to office hours later, we'll be back around 2.45 today. But I'm happy to sit here now for questions. Anyone has questions now? I see none, so let me just wrap up briefly. Um, I think these cases establish a couple of principles. Um, one is that custom matters very much. When judges have these sort of hunting cases, they look to the, the, the customs of the people involved in that profession, the hunters, the baseball fans, the whalers. Judges also consider issues of fairness with the labor theory. And they also consider the capture, which is very certain and easy to apply. And they, they, they weigh these factors to different extents. Okay. All right. Anything else in your mind? Yes, sir. Uh, just please just raise your hand if you want to speak. I, I gotta I gotta see hands, otherwise I don't know where the voice is coming from. Yeah, Zach, go ahead. Um is there I know different professors have their different idiosyncrasies about how to write out things. Is there anything particular? You want to ask me this maybe next class when we're not out of time? I'd be happy to answer this one. I promise. Fair enough. Okay. All right, everyone. I'll see you guys later. Thank you. Have a good weekend, sir. You too. Bye-bye.